to Ironwood Wealth Management's Market Insight webinar for quarter three of 2013. My name is Steve Molinario, and I am a portfolio administrator in Ironwood's investment division. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured presenter, the Chief Investment Officer here at Ironwood, Mr. Sean Rogers. Sean is a charter holder of the financial analyst designation, and he also served as Ironwood's primary investment strategist. If anyone has questions for Sean during the presentation, Please feel free to type them into the questions box on the GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen, and we will definitely do our best to address all of them at the end. So now, without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Sean to lead the evening's presentation. Sean? Thanks, Steve, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my delight to, uh, I don't get to do this very often, but I actually get to do my webinar on a day where the S&P 500 hit its all-time high so far. So that is, uh, that is exciting in and of itself, and uh, I think we've got a good presentation today. Some things that we're going to want to discuss, we've got a lot to go over, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, I want to go over the economy, both domestic uh, and abroad. Um, <clears throat> I want to spend a little bit of time, uh, actually most of the presentation, I want to talk about the Fed and what everybody's probably hearing um, about tapering and what that means. I'm going to try and uh, spend a little bit of time explaining QE and, and how it affects all of our investments. I'm going to talk about the international markets and, and how we see some opportunities there. And then we're going to leave off on valuation and uh, proper long-term planning. So those are the topics to cover. I'll leave it here on our disclosures page for a couple of seconds and then uh, we'll, we'll get into it. I always like starting with this slide or at least the past couple of times I've liked to start with this slide so that we can remember where we've come from. Um, back in 2009, <clears throat> actually August 5th, 2009, we did a webinar. Uh, it was the same time four, exactly four years ago. And we had this slide up here, and you know the S&P was at 1,003, just to give you an idea of where we were. And we showed this slide, and you know it's got okay. Well, what if the S&P reaches its 2007 high in one year, and two years, and three years, and four years? What would the investment return be if we got back to these old highs? Well, it took us four years, so you can see that's a 85. 0.7% cumulative return over four years. The S&P return, uh, had that exactly been four years, would have been 16.7%. So I only bring this slide up to remember, we will go through more recessions going forward. You can see these are all the recessions that we've had. And this one will not be the last. We may not see a as severe of a recession um, during our lifetime, but we could, and I'd just like to remember this so that we can, we can reflect, if, if, it, if we do go through another recession, we can reflect and, and realize that markets can react positively and negatively in very quick manners. Uh, so that's the only reason I bring this up, is to kind of look at where we've come from. Once again, this slide is, is pretty similar from the bottom to where we are now. Um, we've gone up about 160%, actually a little bit higher than that now with where we are today. Um, the other thing to look at is, you know, a lot of people are coming into the office and, and with new money that needs to get to work, folks are asking, is it, is it a good time to get invested? Well, the answer is, we really don't know if it's a good time to get invested or not. We could go through a recession tomorrow, starting tomorrow. Now, we don't think that that's going to happen, um, but it's very difficult to time the market. And one of the reasons we put this in here is time heals a lot when you're talking about investments. If we would have invested in what could have been you know, seen as one of the worst days to have gotten invested in the last 20, 30 years, um, October, I believe it was October 7th, uh, or I'm sorry, October 9th, 2007, and we were to have just not looked at any of our statements, 
um, five and a half years later, we would have opened our statement and you would have made 16.5% um, with dividends being reinvested into the portfolio. You would have been buying, you know, with dividends at attractive prices and lo and behold, five and a half years later, you would have earned 16.5%. Now, in five years, that's not a great return, but it's much better than what cash did over that period of time. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a lot of people who say, oh, you know, I, I got out when the, either they say the Dow or the S&P was at 1,200, and I got back in when the S&P was at 1,200. So I, I missed all that. I missed all the anxiety of, of, of this, you know, this V shape down here. But what they also missed out on was a bunch of dividends that occurred over these years that could have actually helped their return. So, you know, we look back and we reflect because humans tend to forget things pretty quick. And, you know, we're starting to see some, some greed come in. Um, definitely not to the, you know, not to the worrisome degree, but we're definitely seeing some greed. And it's okay to be maybe a little greedy. Um, during this period of time, but we we have to make sure that if something you know if we do go through another recession and, and our you know the market goes down thirty percent um, that we'd be okay with that and we have the correct time frame to get past that. So I always like to start with these slides. I think they're really powerful. Um, this is another one. It just kind of shows okay. Well, here here are the past three market peaks and and right now we're at. 100 points higher than this on the S&P, so we're not at 1606, we're actually at 1705 or 1707. Um, not exactly sure where we officially ended today, but it was just over 1700. And each one of these peaks is a little different. Um, you know, we look at the P.E. ratio back in 2000, we were at 25 times earnings. Uh, that's an over overpriced stock market. Uh, 2007, 15.2. That's not an overpriced or underpriced. That's, you know, about normal for PEs if we look at history. Um, what caused the recession wasn't the fact that we got overpriced. It was we had some serious problems in real estate, and we went through a very, very uh, challenging financial crisis. So, and, and now you look at, okay, well, you know, at 1,700, where are we at a PE multiples? Uh, with with new earnings estimates that have improved now the second quarter, we're at about 14.5. So we're still a little undervalued when it comes to domestic equities compared to history, but we're definitely, it's not, you know, there's not as much, it, it's not as attractive as it was down here, uh, but it also feels a lot better now that we're up here. So it's a double-edged sword, but we still see more opportunity in stocks than we do in bonds. And you can see, you know, the dividend yield on the S&P 500 is still 2% versus the 10-year Treasury uh, sitting at 2.5%. Now you can see back in October it was at 4.7% and back in March 2000 it was at 6.2%. So when you look at where we are now, we're still a lot better off fundamentally than we were at the last two peaks. Um, so it doesn't really help us too much, but it does tell us that, hey, stocks look a little bit more attractive than fixed income. Um, in the long run, you know, you're going to get paid off to be in a diversified portfolio. You're going to get paid off for the risk that you take. And that's really what we want to make sure that all of our clients are matching their risk with their objective, with their portfolio. So what happened in quarter two? Quarter two you know, a lot of investors are scratching their head because they're looking at the S&P 500, they're looking at the Dow Jones, um, they're looking at domestic stocks, and they're saying, hey, se wait a second, you know, the S&P was up during the quarter. How come, how come my portfolio isn't? Well, it's because there are a lot of asset classes that make up portfolios. Um, domestic stocks are just one piece. And you can see domestic stocks, the S&P 500 was up about 3%. Small cap, domestic was up 3%, but contrary to popular belief, not all aggressive assets did well. Uh, emerging markets lost 8% during the quarter. 
Commodities lost 9.5% during the quarter, and, and bonds lost money during the quarter. The 10-year Treasury increased from 1.87% to just under 2.5%. Um, just to give you an idea of where we're at today, uh, this 2.5% 2, 2 is now 2.71%, so we've gone up even further since then. The increase in interest rates uh, is, is the major factor in why we had negative bond returns during the quarter. In fact, we had the biggest quarterly price movement downward in bonds in 45 years. Um, for the past 30 years, bonds have had a tailwind with decreasing interest rates. We're just now starting to see increasing interest rates and how it'll impact bond prices. We're going we're gonna to dive a little deeper into that as well later on. ISM numbers, during the quarter they, they weakened a little bit, uh, but they still were above 50, so we're still growing. Today we got an ISM number of 55.4, uh, which is a very, very strong number, um, and hence why, you know, why, one of the reasons, we, we've gotten some great economic data this week, and that was just another piece of the puzzle to help us with this, you know, with with today's movement in the price of the, of the stock market today, um, and vice versa, why interest rates have been climbing. Um, you know, when the economy is starting to do well, folks are starting to price in that the Fed is going to start exiting their quantitative easing strategy and uh, possibly, you know, down the down the road, starting to increase interest rates. So, economy improving is very good for our aggressive assets, uh, not, not so good for our safer assets, but that's the whole reason that we have both combined, because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. U.S. job market continues to improve. Last three months were similar to the previous six months. Um, so bringing our, our nine month, the last nine months were just uh, right around 200,000 of new jobs per month. So that's a, that's a very positive sign as well. Tomorrow we'll have another jobs report. I'm expecting something around 200 with the possibility with, with a lot of this positive economic data. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a little bit bump of a bump above 200,000, which could cause rates to increase a little bit more, could cause the stock market to go up a little bit more as well. But we'll, we'll find that out tomorrow morning. Uh, asset prices for the quarter, uh, like I already mentioned, small cap is up 3.1 percent, S&P 2.9, uh, so on and so forth here. We've got emerging markets at negative 8 and commodities at negative 9.5, and bonds lost 2.3 percent, the Barclays aggregate bond. U.S. economy continues to improve. So um, yesterday we had GDP numbers come out. The first quarter was revised downward to 1.1% from 1.8%. A lot of a lot of the weakness in the first quarter had to do with the sequestration that happened, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Quarter two surprised a lot of folks. We were we were expecting um, one you know around one percent, and we actually got 1.7% for the first estimate of the second quarter uh, GDP. That's not outstanding, but it's definitely better than they expected, and it's not bad considering the fiscal headwind that we've had to go through because of the sequestration. Cyclical sectors still look very positive. Autos, close to 16 million units. We haven't seen that in, in since pre-recession, since 2007. Housing continues to recover. As you can see, we've had a little bit of dip in housing starts, but if you actually look at permits, uh, that shows a, a little bit better trend. Uh, some of the actual housing starts have a, you know, have a little bit of an impact from weather and, and, and seasonality, uh, whereas permits are a little bit more consistent, and that, that trend looks very, very good. Real capital orders looks great. Uh, inventories look great, so our cyclical sectors look great. The consumer has improved its balance sheets. Same story as, as before. 
I'm running through these slides pretty quick. It's, it's because we've gone through a lot of these, and, and a lot of this hasn't changed all that much. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of folks were able to refinance their house at extremely low levels, saving, you know, hundreds of dollars per month, which now can go into other areas. We're at um, the debt service ratio is at a 30-year low. And we got a little bit of a spike because interest rates have, have gone up. Um, so, you know, some, some of the folks who haven't refinanced or are purchasing new mortgages, it's a little bit more expensive for them uh, to pick up a new mortgage. And then one that's, that's kind of silent here is the net, the net wealth effect or, or net worth. We're at an all-time high in net worth, so that makes people feel better. Well, the biggest, the biggest part of the economy is the consumer, so when the consumer's feeling better, they, they feel like they can go out and spend. Um, we're starting to get a look, you know, a few more jobs added to the market. Uh, wages are starting to go up a little bit, so people are starting to feel better. They're making more money. Their net worth on paper, uh, you know, their house is worth more money. Their 401k or retirement plans are worth more money, and they're starting to feel a little bit better. Corporate finances, very similar story. Low rates has helped. Corporations refinance debt at attractive levels. Uh, corporations have become lean and mean. Um, they're able to, as you can see, they're able to generate internal funds to completely fund their capital expenditures. So we got a gap here where they can actually boost expenditures if they want to, if they see some opportunities. Now, interest. Uh, coverage ratios have improved because one, they've refinanced their debt to more attractive ratios. Two, they've, they've delevered, and that's you can see that over here. Um, and so that's improved the balance sheets dramatically. Until the economy starts to loosen up a little bit, you're going to continue to see companies be conservative over here. But if if we start to to see the economy improve. You can see the, the um, leverage ratio start to creep up a little bit. Now it might not get back up to the levels we saw in the, you know, in the, in the 2000s, uh, but we may get up to, let's say, 140, 160 uh, percent leveraged, which will bring down our interest coverage ratio, um, and, and then companies will start to use that for investment and, and hiring people and, and bringing in new revenues. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with corporations is they they you know squeezed as much as they can out of out of every person and every asset that they have at some point they're going to need new revenues to to continue to grow earnings uh, and so that's kind of where we're we're getting to that gear point um, where we, we can start to see that happening federal finances this one was a little bit of a surprise at how quickly some of this stuff dropped now Politically, you know, everyone's got a different opinion uh, on the sequester. Um, it probably wasn't the, the best thing that happened, the, the way that they did it, um, by having the automatic cuts happen and, and kind of the more meat cleaver approach versus surgical approach. But as you can see, the, the uh, federal deficit to GDP has come way, way down to more normal levels. It's still a little elevated, but it's come down dramatically uh, over the past year, and revenues have come up. You know, more people are working, more people are paying taxes, corporations are earning more, they're paying more taxes, so we're starting to get these things back in line. The sequestration has helped the federal finances, um, however, it has hurt the economy. There's definitely been a headwind because of the sequestration of a probably a, around 1% GDP growth just because we've had these spending cuts, which is neither, neither bad nor good. It just it is what it is. We've improved federal finances, but we've hindered growth a little bit by doing that. But at some point, we have to bring, we have to bring these back into um, more normal levels. Otherwise, we're going to have a debt uh, a total debt that just starts to skyrocket. On the bright side, uh, many many economists thought if we did go through sequestration that it would cause the U.S. economy to go into a double-dip recession. 
Thankfully, that did not and has not occurred yet. Um, and we, we, we don't believe that's going to happen. We believe the economy is, um, is strong enough to withstand and has shown that it's strong enough to withstand the headwinds of the fiscal cliff, or I'm sorry, the, the fiscal head, headwinds from the sequestration. Um, the Fed, on the other hand, is a, is a different story, and we'll get to that here in a second. But here's that, here's that big headwind we're, we're talking about. You know, here's, here's the budget in, in 2012, and we tightened the budget, and actually we, we've actually done even better than these estimates show. Um, you know, we're, we're down here. So we've, we've decreased the budget um, by about 3 or 4% um, of GDP in one year, and we're still growing at, at you know, 1% to 2% for GDP for the first two quarters. So even with that big headwind, we're still able to, to show growth. That's a good sign for the economy. And we're on a, a much more sustainable track when it comes to um, fiscal, the, the fiscal deficit and federal finances. Jobs. The unemployment rate is going to be an important one, um, mostly because the Fed is following it so much. So, so I've got a couple of comments on this. Um, we, we've been doing pretty well. Not, not, you know, not fantastic, but we've been chugging along at 200,000 new jobs created each month. Um, that's a decent amount. A, a, a note to make here is that we, we've got a demographic shift that is changing the way that new jobs are affecting the unemployment rate. It used to be, you know, from, from 1980 to about 2000, the economy needed about 150 new jobs just to keep the unemployment rate steady. So we would need 150 new jobs in tomorrow's report just to stay, and this level is actually 7.5 now, but just to say at 7.5, um, we would need 150 new jobs, 150,000 new jobs. Because of demographics, we've seen the participation rate decrease, mostly because we see a lot of older folks who have seen their, their retirement balances go up, they've, they've refinanced their houses, or they've paid their houses off, and they're in a position where now they can start to think about retirement and they're, they're starting to retire. So we've got more people leaving the workforce than we have added to the workforce. Therefore, we have a participation rate that's declining. Because of that, we really only need about 75,000 new jobs per month to keep the unemployment rate steady. Um, we're going to revisit this whole concept of 75 versus 150 and how it affects this unemployment rate later when we talk about the Fed. Because the Fed is using this unemployment rate to target their exit strategy. So we want to make sure that we know how this unemployment rate is going to react given the fact that we know demographics are to the point where participation is not going to be, is going to continue to decline. So we may see this unemployment rate actually decrease faster than what the Fed may think. The other target that the Fed's looking at in, is inflation, and inflation is not a concern right now. Um, global monetary authorities are trying their hardest to reflate economies by printing money, but we really haven't seen, we've, been, we've seen a subdued inflationary number. So it's, it's not an issue right now. But it, Inflation is one of those things that can creep up on us pretty quick, so we always want to keep an eye on it. Right now, the Fed is not worried about uh, a, a below 2% inflation rate. Consumer confidence has improved dramatically over the past couple of months. Uh, in June, the consumer confidence number was 82.1, uh, the highest since 2007. And in July, it was a little bit lower than that, 80.3. Uh, but that, that number is still the highest since 2007. So consumers are feeling a lot better. That probably has to do with the balance sheet, the consumer balance sheet that we looked at a little earlier. 
which is going to help the economy because now consumers are going to spend a little bit more money or they're, they're going to feel like they can spend a little bit more money, which is going to help that biggest portion of GDP. All right, this is where I want to spend most of the time. I, I kind of went through those previous slides pretty quick. So we always go through those slides. Not much has changed. Um, things have improved slightly. The, the U.S. economy is kind of chugging along. Um, what's really driving markets right now is the Fed and what they're saying and their exit plans. So what I want to start with here is uh, the other day we had a client come in and, and she asked, well, you know, because I, I, being the person that I am, I, I said, well, the, the Fed is, is doing QE. Um, and so a logical person would ask, well, what is QE? You know, uh, if you're not an expert in the field, you might not know what QE is. So I want to spend some time explaining what QE is. QE is quantitative easing. It's what the Fed started doing back in 2008. What QE is, is, they, is the Fed is printing money to buy assets. And so you can see they printed money out of thin air and bought assets from banks. And so they, they buy these assets, the assets go on the balance sheet of the Fed. You can see here the Fed's balance sheet went from, you know, roughly one to almost four. Right here is this last QE that they've done where they've been purchasing $85 billion of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries every month, um, you know, for the past uh, six or eight months or so. So that, that's what quantitative easing is. It, it's, it's easy monetary policy, and it helps liquidity. Now, usually a policy like that would create inflation because you've got all this excess money. It's got to go somewhere. But what's happening right now is think of all this liquidity as a lake, and the banks are trying to to give this liquidity out, but they're trying to give it, give it out in a straw versus a fire hose or something bigger. Um, one of my clients mentioned, okay, so the bandwidth, uh, you know, how fast is that lake, how fast is that lake being drained is the bandwidth, which is kind of this money multiplier. So the money multiplier or the velocity of money is how, how much are those banks loaning out to folks? Well, they're, they're not loaning money out very, they, they're not loaning it out very easily. You have to be a very, very good borrower. You have to basically prove that you don't need the money in order to get the money. And that's why the money multiplier has gone down, you know, from close to nine down to 3.3. This is why we have not seen inflation. It doesn't mean that this money multiplier, you know, things start to, start to move with the economy and this money multiplier doesn't kick up and now, We've got a problem because now inflation starts to spike and the Fed can't exit these markets quick enough. So to get ahead of that, Ben Bernanke's been trying to, to outline the exit strategy. So, so that's QE, and that's Q, QE uh, was something they did in 2008 because they ran out of, of their other tool, which is, you know, the Fed funds rate. They can, the Fed can change the Fed funds rate, which basically dictates other interest rates, they, they brought that rate down to zero. Once they brought that down to zero, they had no more, they can't, you know, you can't make the Fed's fund rate negative. Um, one of the thing, things that the Fed follows is, the, is what's called the Taylor Rule. And the Taylor Rule just gives us an idea of, okay, well, um, where should the Fed funds rate be, all else equal? Um, it, 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 back in 2008, 2009, the, Fed, the Taylor rule was suggesting that the Fed funds should be negative 4%. So that's when the Fed said, okay, well, we can't make the federal funds rate negative 4%. We can only make it zero, which they did very quickly. They, you know, we went from above 4 to 0 in a very short period of time, and it's been zero for three and a half years. Once they ran out of that, in order to get a what's perceived as a negative uh, Fed funds rate, they've got to participate in this quantitative easing to make 
money even easier to buy uh, assets and to drive down interest rates even further, which, which they did. Um, the 10-year Treasury got all the way down to 1.5%, um, which helped a lot of companies, which helped a lot of um, consumers by refinancing debt um, at lower rates so that they could save some money on a monthly basis or do another project that was more profitable at a lower interest rate. All, all good things must come to an end, and that's kind of where we're at now. So on, on May 22nd, Ben Mernanke came out and, and told Congress that QE, quantitative easing, may be slowed down by year end. This surprised the market because they were expecting that to happen next year. They were expecting the $85 billion to start slowing down next year sometime, not by the end of the year. So. On May 22nd, we, we saw a shift up in interest rates. Then Ben Bernanke came out again on June 19th, about a month, a little less than a month later, and he even gave more clarity on tapering QE, and markets reacted negatively. Interest rates went up dramatically in a 48-hour period after he spoke, um, which then caused, or at the same time caused, equity markets to come down for the fear that, oh my gosh, the Fed's leaving maybe too quickly and that's going to cause interest rates to go up, which is going to cause housing to do poorly, which is maybe cause another recession. So that's, that's the reason stocks went down. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily, it, it was, in our estimation, it was more because of interest rates increasing that the stock market went down and not uh, that we were worried about a slowing economy. A major um, driver of monetary policy going forward, as stated by Ben Bernanke in some of these, during some of these um, conference, press conferences that he gave, uh, will be how quickly the unemployment rate comes down. Ben Bernanke basically said that the Fed would be done buying assets, so they would be done doing the $85 billion per month. Uh, by the time the unemployment rate got to 7%. He went on to say that the Fed would also begin to raise the Fed funds rate, this right here, so they, they stopped buying bonds, and they so the balance sheet would stop getting bigger. Uh, they let some of these kind of roll off, so eventually the assets with the asset, the balance sheet would start to decrease. And then when the unemployment rate was down to 6.5%, they may even start to increase the Fed funds rate. Now, that's all, that's all great, and, and we've got to have a plan for exit because QE can't last forever and low interest rates can't last forever. Um, the market didn't expect uh, these things to happen so quickly. In fact, uh, if we go back... And, and, and I guess to start off with, we'll say the FOMC estimates that the unemployment rate will reach 6.5%. They believe that that's going to happen August 2015 with, based on their estimates. So between now and August 15th, or I'm sorry, August 2015, they would be done with quantitative easing and they would start to increase the Fed funds rate. However, uh, what we believe is that the unemployment rate is going to come down faster because of that thing that I talked about earlier, the demographics, more people retiring, the participation rate going down. Um, so we, we uh, J.P. Morgan actually did an analysis uh, based on the participation rate that we currently have. If the average jobs created per month is 150, uh, they believe that we'll get down to 6.5%, not in August 2015, but in January 2015. And if we take that a step further, if we have 200,000 jobs created per month, what we've done over the last nine months, then we get to 6.5% in April 2014. 
So a much quicker, that's over a year faster than what the FOMC thinks. If we have stronger uh, job gains than that, and let's say 250000 per month, we could get there as fast as January 2014. So in our estimation, the Fed, the Fed is, is thinking that the unemployment rate is going to come down a little bit slower than what we actually think it's going to come down. And so we think they're going to act a little faster than, than what they've been telling the market, uh, which means interest rates will increase a little faster. So we've actually made some changes, some more changes in the, in the bond portfolio to shorten the duration um, of, our, of our bond portfolio. So that, that's one of the things that we're doing in, in anticipation of higher interest rates sooner rather than later. Okay. So that's the Fed, and that's kind of you know the, the first part of what's happened over this past quarter with in regards to the Fed. Now, you can see the interest rates increase right here, and then this only goes to 2.49. We're actually at 2.71 as of today. Um, retail and institutional investors have been flocking from bond funds at a rapid pace. June. There were $80 billion that came out of bond funds from retail and institutional investors. <clears throat> but, the, but the Fed is buying $85 billion of those, of those same bonds uh, or similar bonds. So the rate still spiked even though we had net inflows. If you, if you think of the, the Fed and institutional investors together, we still had a positive flow into bonds even though we had a, a huge outflow when it came to retail and institutional investors. Uh, so that's kind of what we want to get in front of. Um, when, the, when the Fed stops exiting, who's going to be buying bonds? Well, we think there's going to be a lot of sellers of bonds. We want to, we want to get ahead of, of that because we think interest rates have, have no choice but to go further north from where they are now. If they do go further north, all bonds are not going to react similar. All bonds are not created equal. So this chart right here just shows, okay, well, if we have a 1% rise, let's just focus on rise tonight. I don't want to deal with the, the falling of interest rates. I, I think there's probably more of a chance of a rise than a fall. So let's just focus on the rise tonight. Uh, if we have a 1% rise in 10-year treasuries, uh, here's what bond prices will do. The longer the duration, you know, a 30-year U.S. Treasury, 1% increase is going to be a 20% decrease in your bond. 10-year uh, Treasury is going to be almost a 10% decrease in your bond. So bonds with shorter duration or shorter maturity are going to be impacted less than bonds with longer maturities. Then we have floating rate. Floating rate bonds, their interest rate changes every 90 days. They have a very small interest rate sensitivity. Convertibles have a smaller interest rate sensitivity. High yield, U.S. high yield, more tied with, with equity prices than it is really with, with interest rates. Um, and so you, you see you know, an increase in the 10-year Treasury will impact different bonds differently. And so we've built the portfolio with this in mind. But also in, with, with an unknown future ahead of us. Um, yes, we think the interest rates are going to increase, but you really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We could go through a double dip recession, which then bonds would be a good investment. So we want to make sure that we have a good balance of both based on really what each individual is trying to get accomplished. I thought, I thought this was a, a really good piece here. Uh, it just shows, you know, really how, how much impact the Fed had uh, on markets in general. So this is the performance uh, between June 18th and June 20th. This is when Ben Bernanke came out um, and basically spooked the markets by, by by giving his testimony and, and putting some, some numbers on the unemployment you know, and when they would end tapering. And you can see in a two-year 
two-day period of time for bond prices. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. aggregate was down 1.1 percent. Uh, munis were down 1.6. TIPS were down 1.3. Uh, emerging markets were down 2.1. Emerging market debt, I should say. Treasury, a 10-year Treasury was down 2 percent. This was because of the interest rate spike. Gold down 5.4 percent. Uh, WTI crude was down 3.4 percent. The yen and the euro were both down big. The S&P 500, in reaction to an increase in interest rates so quickly, equities kind of had to do a, a, a pause. And, and we didn't really get confirmation of this until after. Um, we, we believed, and, and um, we, we actually had discussions internally, that it was really the equities um, that were reacting to interest rates and not interest rates that were reacting to a, a slower economy. It was actually the reverse. We were seeing a, a better economy. Ben Bernanke was saying, we've got a better economy that might be able to withstand us pulling back a little bit on quantitative easing. And so that's really why we saw the, the stock market pull back is because investors were, were really in an unknown period. How is this going to affect things? Is this going to cause us to go into a recession You know, if interest rates spike up? So the, the reason that we were able to confirm that, that that was really the case was since the market bottom on June 24th, the S&P 500 is actually up, uh, when, I, when I wrote this seminar, it was up 8%. Now it's, now it's up uh, uh, over 10% since June 24th. Um, yet the 10-year Treasury is, is actually higher than it was um, on June 20th. So... This confirms that this was a bond thing. This was an interest rate thing. And if we, if we look at, you know, where, where are we at, the economy's better. Tapering might end sooner rather than later. Interest rates went up, but stock prices also went up. That's exactly what we want to have, want to have happen. Now, over a short run, all assets went down. That's not good for portfolios. Even if it's a diversified portfolio, if everything goes down, um, your whole portfolio is going to go down. But now that our, our aggressive assets have now re, revamped and, and have gone higher, they can pull up the returns of the entire portfolio in lieu of our, our assets that are dragging because the economy is improving. So that's exactly what we want to have happen. If you look at you know, some of the bonds that, that don't really have as much interest rate sensitivity, uh, the high yield and the floating rate, those are actually, they've made a full recovery since June 19th um, versus their, their safer counterparts. So, you know, those are the types of bonds that are not created the same as some of these safer bonds. We want to make sure that we have a, a pretty healthy staple of those bonds in our bond portfolio going forward if we believe interest rates are going to go up. This slide right here is very important for a diversified portfolio. It's, it's what did not happen initially in that 48-hour period. This is just showing that if interest rates are, if the 10-year Treasury is below 5%, increased interest rates usually come with increased stock prices. They are positively correlated when we are below 5%, so like in an environment we are now. Once we get to 5%, it starts to hurt the stock market a little bit more. So 5% is kind of the, where, it, where, it, uh, where, where you start to see where any increase above 5% starts to hurt the market more than it helps the market. So we believe that until we get to 5%, you're going to see things like, okay, the economy is improving, stocks are doing well, bonds are not doing well. That phenomenon will work. So our stocks will help pull our bonds up during that period of time. If for some reason something causes us to go into another recession, well, we still have bonds to hold us up when our stocks go down. So this, this, this correlation, this negative correlation is, I'm sorry, this positive correlation with, with yields, uh, negative correlation with prices is what we want to see for our diversified portfolio. So that's why I added this slide in. Correlation to the 10-year Treasury returns. So these are just this just shows 
the correlation between the 10-year Treasury and U.S. aggregate investment grade, emerging market debt, and high yield. And you can see emerging market and high yield, um, they don't have a big, a, a big correlation to 10-year Treasuries, which is exactly what I've been talking about during this presentation. However, <laughs> when stress happens, correlations tend to spike. Everyone sells everything, and then you get a... And then you get a, a, and then you get the real reaction where high yield has come back. Emerging markets haven't really come back as, as much as I'd like to see them, but I don't think that's really an interest rate thing. I think that's more an emerging markets thing. We'll get we'll get to international here in a second. Uh, but U.S. aggregate, some of these safer bonds, they do act like ten-year treasuries. We want to make sure that. Um, if, if we think interest rates are going up, we want to be smart about the, the bonds that we're holding. Uh, emerging market debt, high yield debt might be more attractive in increasing um, rate environments like we could be in going in the future. Once again, not all bonds are created equal. International. So I, I, I just touched on it uh, with emerging markets. Um, Europe. Let's talk about Europe. Europe decided to not not really follow the U.S.'s playbook, um, and they suffered from it. Instead of instead of having uh, more easy monetary policy and instead of uh, pro-growth strategies, they decided to partake in austerity, and because of that, they saw a double dip recession. Here's the first recession. Here's the second recession. This is a double dip recession. Unemployment is still at 11% in the EU. Um, there's been a lot of pain in Europe. However, things are starting to look more positive. And not only are they starting to look more positive, but all of this austerity that they've been going through is going to ease up the next three years. So they've had 3.3% GDP drag over the, the past three years, that's going to drop to only 1.1% of a headwind in the next three years. That's going to be very positive for those markets. If you couple that with where prices are internationally, especially in, in the Eurozone and some other developed markets, it makes for a very attractive place to be for international. Now, it, it, uh, international has lagged over the last three years, both emerging markets and developed markets. That's what's creating some of the opportunities that we see, and it's because they decided to try it a little bit differently with austerity, um, and it, it so far hasn't played out as well as, as where the U.S. is, uh, which is in a much better position, but also at higher prices when it comes to the stock market. Here is a, a chart of, of PMI indexes, and I'm just going to point out a few of them uh, and, and give you a kind of an update here. We've got the euro area. If we look at the euro area for June, if we combine these, we'd be at 48.8. In July, the numbers we just got this week, that number is 50.1. So that's growing now. Any number above 50, and we're, we're growing versus contracting. So June, 48.8. That's contracting, July 50.1. Things are starting to look a, a little bit better in the Eurozone. And you can, you can see just, you know, all these reds that we've seen, they're starting to become yellows. And if we were to update this, we have a couple of greens on here in this Eurozone, Germany, France, UK, Italy, Spain, Greece, Ireland. Um, China. China was also over 50. We found that out this morning. That's what initially gave us uh, the boost this morning in, in pre-market trading. The futures were boosted because the China PMI was over 50. That's also an improvement from 48.2 that they had in June. The U.S., uh, we just got numbers uh, out at 55.4 this morning. That was the second leg up uh, of this morning's rally. That is very positive. These are, these are improving numbers. And you're, you're seeing it not just in the U.S., you're seeing it around the globe. These, these, economic, these leading economic indicators are starting to improve um, at, a, at a decent clip. Now, Ben Bernanke's uh, uh, conferences and, and his testimony and, and 
the things he's telling the market did not just impact the, the uh, U.S. bond market. As you can see here, it in, impacted bond markets around the world. <clears throat> you can see the spike here. That's basically the same spike that we've seen in U.S. Treasuries, and that's mostly because of quantitative easing and the Fed being transparent and saying, hey, you know, we're really on the way out of this um, instead of, of prolonging it for much longer. We think the economy is on solid footing and we're going to start to decrease these as unemployment comes down and as the economy gets stronger over time. China's growth has not been stellar. You can see here, uh, you know, we've had a declining, um, since 2010, we've had a declining GDP. Uh, that's going to continue to happen. We can't expect, we can't expect China to, to, to grow at 10% um, for, uh, for a long period of time. They're, they're an emerging economy, and just like the U.S., uh, when we went through our boom, our GDP slowly, slowly uh, downshifted over over the years, and that's what's going to end up happening with China as well. But 7.8 is still is still way up there. So we still expect China to be a major driver of economic growth uh, for the foreseeable future. And more and more, of the reports are suggesting that China will have a soft landing versus a hard landing. But once again, this phenomenon here, China has not performed very well. Emerging markets have not performed very well over the past three years. Cyclical sectors, they don't look great. They don't look horrible. Um, it, it's why emerging markets, it's one of the reasons why emerging markets have not performed up to par, and it's why they look a lot more attractive right now than some of the U.S. markets. I think, I think this is the mo one of the most important slides of, of tonight is really, you know, one, we want to make sure that we're not just focused on domestic markets when we're looking at our portfolios, when we're looking at the markets. Yeah, it's great to look at what the S&P has done, but look at, look at year to date. This is, uh, these are as of the middle of the year, so these, all these numbers have improved. But in U.S. dollar terms, the S&P is up 13.8. Uh, the rest of uh, the International Developed Market Index is only up 4.5. Emerging markets are down 10, 9.4. So it is a different story depending on where, where we're looking at it. But it also creates opportunities. Uh, the developed market, it's 47% from its peak in 2007. So it's still got a long way to go. These look like the charts that I started us off with on the U.S. on the S&P 500. Emerging markets, similar story. So we want to we wanna actually put more emphasis <coughs> Excuse me. We want to put more emphasis on both of these areas, which we have consistently done um, over the over the recent future or over the recent past. We've been we've been increasing our exposure to both of these areas inside of our portfolios. Valuations kind of kind of hits on the same point that I'm trying to make here with where we see opportunities. Um, you know, the brown mark is the average. Uh, the blue dot is kind of current, and you can kind of see where, you know, the United States is a little bit closer to fairly valued uh, versus other developed um, markets were, were a little bit undervalued. Uh, Canada, very undervalued. And then we look at uh, emerging markets, and you can see it's kind of a mixed bag here. We've got Mexico and Indonesia very overvalued, and then we've got India, China, Russia, Brazil, the BRIC nations are really the, the ones that I, I see the most opportunity in. These are significantly undervalued comparison to where they, they normally are in history. So the BRIC nations the, of the emerging markets are the ones that we see really good opportunity um, and really attractive prices going forward. <clears throat> Global value, equity valuations, you know, we need to look at yield alternatives. So we need, we need to look at, okay, well, what is emerging market debt paying us? Well, it's paying us about 5.6%. Uh, 
Uh, preferred stocks paying us about 4.9%. U.S. REITs are paying us 3.6%. Um, international REITs, 3.5%. And then some of these bonds that are not so interest rate sensitive, they're not paying us as much, but as in interest rates increase, those areas should be paying us more, and, and they should not have price fluctuations like you would see with a 10-year government bond. So that's just showing us some of these yield alternatives. And then we've, we've got equity dividend yields. And, and you know, uh, the U.S., our 10-year government bond is slightly over the dividend now because we've had this increase in rates. Before, when this was at 1.87, we were getting paid more to just wait in the S&P 500 than we were to buy a 10-year Treasury. Well, you know, what has more upside potential over 10 years, the S&P 500 or a 10-year Treasury? We, we, we had, a, we, we had a, a very backwards Treasury market for a long period of time. When the S&P is yielding more than a 10-year Treasury, that doesn't happen very often in history. Uh, so now you're starting to see that creep up. Um, but in, in international, you're, start, you're, you're still seeing that the equity dividends are paying us more than the corresponding 10-year government bond yield of these countries. So internationally, we still see, you know, we're, we're getting paid 3 or 4 percent uh, dividends in some of our international holdings and emerging markets to sit there with this, with this opportunity of, um, with this opportunity still available. So we're getting paid to wait uh, with some opportunity in our, in our minds, and that, that's what really makes some of those international markets attractive. Cash accounts, you know, we, we've seen a lot of bonds in June and in, in July. Uh, we've seen outflows in bonds that, have, that we haven't seen in a very, very long period of time. Right now, that money is not, it's not really going to stocks. It's really been going to cash, um, and, and we still have very high levels of cash. We're coming from March 2009, which was a you know was one of the worst recessions we've seen since the Great Depression. It was the worst recession we've seen since the Great Depression. Actually, if you combine the the two recessions in the early 80s, it that it was as big as as those combined. And you can see a lot of people were worried. A lot of folks. Um, stockpiled cash at, at rates we've we've never seen before. And even even though we've come down, we're still at the recessionary levels of, of October two thousand two. So there there's still a possibility for a great rotation from bonds to stocks that could give the stock market another leg up and give the bond market another leg down. So that's kind of that's kind of the playbook that we see happening over the next couple of years is increasing interest rates, uh, folks kind of rotating if they feel comfortable out of bonds, maybe into cash, from cash into equities at some point um, when they when they realize that they need to earn more than what cash is offering. So that's that's kind of the the playbook here, and th and then here's uh, you know th these numbers are only through May. Uh, we actually saw some some uh, bond outflows for the first time in a long time, and some big bond outflows in both June and July. And it's no wonder that interest rates went from, you know, below 2% all the way to today when we're at 2.7%. Um, it's because, one, Ben Bernanke, and two, um, investors acted on, on, on those comments that Ben Bernanke made. We still haven't seen the inflows to equities, and that's kind of, you know, what's perplexing here is uh, th this bond money must be going into the cash, um, and it, it quite hasn't made its way to the equity market. Uh, although, you know, with, with economic data like we've gotten this week, um, I'm sure that there's been some flows to equities, and that's what's driven the stock market up um, partly this week. So we, we kind of see that as a continuing trend. Some more valuation metrics here. Um, you know, we're we're still, even though we're more normally valued than we have been in, in more recent past, 
uh, we're, we're still, you know, we're still undervalued when we look at the 15-year average and the, and the 10 year average uh, at 13.9. Um, you know, we're still below the 16.4, which is the 15 average, and, and it's it's pretty close to what the 25-year average is as well, um, with the exception of, of uh, price to sales, which is now 1.5, which is you know similar to its long-term average. These are all these are all these numbers are still saying that equities are are still undervalued a little bit, not nearly as much uh, on an absolute basis as they were. I think the bigger piece here is er the earnings yield. Uh, you know what you get from owning an S and P 500 versus what you get from owning a bond. Stocks are relatively much more attractive than bonds, and so if that continues to be the case, we're still going to want to want to err to the side of stocks. We're still going to get paid more. It, it's more attractive for our risk in stocks than than in, than in fixed income or bonds. Um, Wanted to update everybody on the earnings outlook for the second quarter. So far, uh, with the information that we have, with the data we have, uh, 310 companies have reported. Uh, the estimate uh, that, that we're seeing for quarterly earnings is $26.36 per share for the S&P 500 companies, which would be a new earnings record. 68% um, of companies have beat earnings, and 45% have beat on revenue. Year over year, earnings are up 3.7%. Uh, With the strength of the dollar, that's that's not a that's not a bad that's that's not a bad number. So, once again, we're we're still positive on stocks, not as much as we were um, when they were at much more attractive levels. Um, but uh, they're they're a heck of a lot more attractive than than bonds at this point. I like these slides because it just gets back to uh, you know ultimately we we can't time the markets and and you get paid for the risk that you take over long periods of time. This just shows okay well if we take every period every one year period where PE ratios have been fourteen and a half, uh, do we see a pattern? No, there's no real pattern when we look at a one-year period. It, it's hit or miss. So it's basically saying it's very hard to predict what the next 12 months of, uh, return is going to be based on a PE multiple. 14.5, um, it, it you know that may that may seem high if earnings you know start to to um, erode, then then that number is going to look a lot higher than it is. Um, for stock prices, stock prices would have to come down to get back to a, a more normal level. So on a one-year basis, all I'm trying to show here is that it's very hard to predict where the market's going to be if you just know the PE multiple. However, if we say, okay, well, what about five years from now? And if anyone's going to be investing in stocks, five years, um, if we're looking at stocks, we're, we're going to tell you that five years is a minimum number you need to, to be looking at the stock market. Uh, you know, but if we look at that at 14.5, we do we do start to see a trend here. You know, you start to see a lot more of a trend than say over here, and everything is kind of around this this trend line here. And you can see that if if we've got 14 and a half multiple, you know, we should be looking at the next five years to be you know somewhere around. Let's just cut it in half here. Uh, a a big chunk of these um, occur. Um, at uh, at about 10% rate of return annualized over the next five years. Not to say that that's going to happen, but 14.5 um, multiple is is not an expensive multiple. Another one that I that I love putting in here, uh, they they update these annually, um, is the power of diversification. We have three simple assets. Our rate of return is 7.43. Our risk or standard deviation is 10.8. If we add emerging, or I'm sorry, equity market neutral, commodities, real estate, um, small cap, uh, some emerging markets, if we add those into the portfolio, okay, now our return actually goes up 
and our risk goes down. So we're smoothing, smoothing the ride out a little bit and we're increasing our rate of return. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to build a portfolio with the highest expected return for each given level of risk that, that each of our clients are willing to take. And then 20-year annualized returns by asset class. I like looking at this. The S&P 500 over the last 20 years is up 8.2% uh, on an annualized basis. That's a, that's a pretty good number. Uh, but the average investor, uh, their return over that same 20-year period of time is 2.3%. Um, the biggest reason why this is 2.3 versus 8.2 is not because they're not taking enough risk. It's because they're jumping in and jumping out of the market, trying to time the market. Um, they're, they're basing their decisions on emotions and how they feel versus a more disciplined approach uh, of building a portfolio that matches your objective. <clears throat> Once again, if you've been on these, you've seen this slide before. In the short run, we have no idea what equities are going to do. Uh, over this 62-year period of time, we've seen equities do as well as 51% for the year, all the way down to negative 37%. Even bonds. We don't really know what bonds are going to do. They've done as, as good as 43% and as bad as negative 8% a 50-50 portfolio of half stock, half bond <clears throat> has done as good as 32 and as bad as 15. These are all, these are all not, not acceptable. Um, if we have one year to invest, we don't want you investing in stocks and we don't want you investing in bonds. There's a possibility you could lose, let's say we looked at a, a diversified portfolio, you, you know, you invest uh, a million bucks into a portfolio like that, you're down 150 grand. That's, that's, for a time frame of one year, if we need to use that million bucks for something, that's not a good use of our money because there's a, there's a chance that we could be down. Versus, okay, well now let's, let's expand that from one year now to 10 years. Well, that same 50-50 portfolio over 10 years, the best rate of return annualized has been 17, that would be, that would be great to have a 17% rate of return for, ten, for a 10-year period of time on a 50-50 portfolio. The worst period of time is 2%. So now we're not, we're not having to deliver bad news. Yeah, 2% is not great over a 10-year period, but at least we made money. So if we're going, if we're going to be investing uh, into the stock and bond market, we don't want to have to deliver bad news. We want to make sure that you have the correct time frame so that we can start to expect the correct rate of return for the risk that we're taking. So that's all this slide is trying to say is, look, you've got to have the right holding period um, and expectations for each of your assets and each, and, and, and each of your investments. Another one, this is, this is actually a new one. We haven't had this one in the presentation before, but I, I really like this one. Uh, this is showing from uh, 1980 until present every annual rate of return or loss. Uh, but then it also shows within the year how much did the market point to point, what was the biggest drop during the year. So despite average intra-year drops, so the average intra-year drop is almost 15%. So no matter, no matter what year it is, there's a, there's a good chance we're going we're gonna to have a period of time when the S&P 500 is down 15% point-to-point um, point sometime within the year. However, even with that being the case, annual returns have been positive 25 out of 33 years. So when you're investing in the stock market, expect volatility. It should not surprise us that the market goes up 30% and down 20% or uh, what, you know, however, however it moves on that particular year. That's how the stock market works. That's why you get paid more to expose your money there, and that's why we have to have the correct time frame. So I, I thought that was a neat slide to add in here. Um, 
our, our stance really has not changed all that much. Um, exactly what we've been saying is, is actually occurring. The, the economy is getting better, slowly but surely. Uh, interest rates have started to increase. So, you know, that's why we've been underweight fixed income, underweight safe treasuries, underweight precious metals, um, underweight REITs. These are uh, REITs are income producing assets. Uh, some of the things where we see opportunities, I already talked about emerging market equities, market neutral is just a, a different place to be. And instead of taking interest rate risk, we can have some of our, our fixed income exposure be in market neutral, floating rate bonds that aren't as interest rate sensitive. Commodities have really gotten hammered, so uh, minus precious metals, um, commodities look like they could be pretty attractive at these levels. So the game plan hasn't really changed all that much. We've just started to see what, we, what we've kind of been expecting, uh, which is increase, increasing interest rates uh, along with an increasing stock market or increasing aggressive assets. Um, the, the past 10 years, uh, from 03 to 2012, you can see, you know, where we've had some pretty good returns. Um, you know, although over the last 10 years, um, it, it would have been better to be in some of these international markets, EFA and uh, emerging markets, these international markets, excuse me, um, and not so much in the S&P. Over the last three years, the S&P has done very well. So we've had 16, uh, two in 2011, and 15 in 2010. And then so far, year to date, we're up 14 uh, through midway. And now we're, we're almost up 20, if, if you look at today. Um, so it's been great to be in the S&P over the last three or four years, and not so good to be in the emerging mar or the international markets, excuse me, uh, but if we look out 10 years, uh, you know, then you can see, okay, well, maybe it does make sense to be in emerging markets for the long run. Uh, maybe it does make some sense to be in, in international, developed international. Uh, so it's, you know, there, you always go through periods where domestic does better than international. We want to make sure that we have all types of, of equities so that we smooth out that ride. And you can see that this asset allocation portfolio over the last 10 years, We've made 117, almost 118 percent, which is 8.1 percent annualized. That's not too bad. That's a that's a pretty good rate of return uh, over a 10-year period of time in that diversified asset allocation portfolio, which, just so everybody knows, consists of 25 percent the S&P, 10 percent small cap, 15 percent developed international, 5 percent emerging markets. 30% Barclays Capital Aggregate, 5% Market Neutral, and 5% Commodities, 5% REIT as well. So with that type of portfolio, we would have earned 8.1%. Um, that is uh, definitely, um, that definitely would, uh, we would probably be pretty happy if, if we earned 8.1% over the past 10 years. With that, I'm going to go ahead and leave it to questions. Steve's going to go ahead and, and read the questions that we have, and I will do my best to answer them to the best of my ability. All right. Thanks, Ian. Uh, looks like we have a couple of questions. First one up here is, does the Fed's QE policy have anything to do with why gold has lost so much value? Uh, that's a great question. Um, that, that, is a, that is a fantastic question. Yes, absolutely. In our opinion, uh, one of the reasons that gold spiked up so dramatically is because the Fed was participating in this easy monetary policy. Not only the Fed, but global central banks from around the world are all printing money. Well, when you're printing money, what's going to happen is you're going to, you know, your, your inflation expectations are going to be high. And so what happens during a period like that, a lot of investors will flock to gold and precious metals. Well, when we don't really see that inflation and when Ben Bernanke announces, hey, we might be done with quantitative easing, you're going to start to see gold prices go back to where, you know, where, they, where maybe the fundamental value for them um, it is a little bit more in line, which in our estimation, is somewhere you know between 
$800 and $1,200 an ounce um, based, on, based on inflation and, and, and how gold has reacted in previous periods. Um, that's kind of our thoughts on gold. All right, great. Uh, looks like I have one more here, and it is, what are the assets, the bank assets, that the Fed has been buying for QE? Um, the Fed has been buying treasuries. So uh, they've been buying treasuries from banks, and they've also been buying mortgage-backed securities. Um, we, we, can go, we can go out and buy treasuries, and we can go out and buy mortgage-backed securities um, in the open market. Banks are, or I'm sorry, the Fed is just doing it from banks, um, but we're to the point, if I go back to that slide here, oops, uh, let's go back to that balance sheet slide of the Fed. Oh, here we go. So you can see here, here are the agency mortgage-backed securities. Um, those have increased along with the U.S. Treasuries. Those have also increased. And then you've got the other, uh, which has stayed about the same. But the $85 billion is, is both between treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And those are, those are, safe, those are pretty safe bonds um, that are very tied to the U.S. government. Okay. Very, very good questions, though. Well, we have one more. It okay. looks like with the S&P now over 1,700, will you rebalance the portfolios? With that being said, it seems that you have said that you are not rebalancing now since the portfolio predicted, since your portfolio is what is, yeah, since you predicted in the portfolio what would happen now. Um, and and be, before we had that pullback in the market, um, let's see if I have a chart here that will depict what I'm trying to show. Before we had this, the pullback, we went, we went basically up to about 1675. And then we pulled back all the way to 1575-ish. So you can kind of see it here. We were up, and then we pulled back. Had we not had that pullback when we hit 1700, we were going to rebalance the portfolios. But we had the we had the pullback. Uh, we had the pullback, and that is going to change our rebalance philosophy. We'll probably be rebalancing. Um, closer to 1750 now because we had that pullback. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the economic data that's come out has been very strong. We, we can see, we, we don't want to rebalance too quickly and miss out on, on, on some of the upside. But at the same time, we, we also don't want to be too greedy. Um, so if, if, uh, if we hit a one year without rebalancing, which we still have plenty of time before that happens, uh, but, I, but I would say around 1750 is the next time that we're going to want to rebalance the accounts, take some off of stocks, and, and end up putting it into bonds. But hopefully, if that happens, we're, we're looking at bond rates of you know 3%, which make bonds a lot more attractive than they were when they were at 1.5%. So that's, that's also a great question. That one probably came from uh, someone here inside the office, I'll bet. <laughs> All right. Those are actually all the questions that we have. So if you're right. ready to wrap things up soon. Absolutely. Thank you guys for uh, joining in. Um, we'll have another one of these next quarter. And uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear from some of the upcoming events we have uh, from Stephanie. So with that, I will say good night and have a great weekend. Take care.